Hey everybody, Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. Here we are still covering the Gettysburg Battlefield. We are live on Stevens Knoll. Don't try to find us, we'll be gone before you get here. Stevens Knoll is sort of a, 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 a shelf off of Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill is on the Union right flank. The fish hook that is shaped like this, we are right about here near, near uh, Culp's Hill. The Union fish hook on July 2nd and 3rd mostly goes from Culp's Hill. It's gonna go around around Cemetery Hill. Look at Chris White behind the camera throwing up graphics and everything at once. It's gonna curve around that hill and then you don't have to pan there, but it's gonna go like the, uh, the shank all the way down to the round tops where the eye of the hook is. As Charlie Fennell often says, and I agree with him, Culp's Hill's more important than the little round top. And if you look at a fish hook itself, where's the barb of the hook? It's on the Union right at Culp's Hill. So what you have here, we've already talked about it. Now we've already posted a Spangler Spring video. So we talked about July 3rd. We already shot and soon we'll post our Culp's Hill video where we talk about that fighting on mostly July 2nd. But now we've leapfrogged over actually to, to something even before Spangler Spring to talk about the fighting on Stevens Knoll here, named after a guy we'll talk about in a second, as well as the fighting on East Cemetery Hill. That's a part of Cemetery Hill that's east of the Baltimore Pike and that you might be able to see somewhat in the distance. So with that, let me turn it over to Chris White behind the camera. Um, he's gonna speak from behind the camera or maybe hand it to one of us and talk about Stevens and his knoll. All right, thanks Gary. Uh, you know, at the time of the battle, this is known as McKnight's Hill. Uh, actually it has a couple different names for it, but it was McKnight's Hill. Uh, it's about five acres owned by a 44 year old farmer here. Uh, and this is actually one of the first pieces of land that will be preserved as part of the Gettysburg Battlefield. Uh, you'll notice the monument to Henry Slocum, Henry Warner Slocum, who's the second in command of the Union Army here at Gettysburg. He is the 12th Corps commander, and for a time, a right wing commander, just to very much confuse people. We're looking to the north from Stevens Knoll, you might see the big green water tower on East Cemetery Hill. And then looking out to the right here, we're looking towards the east, towards Benner's Hill, as well as towards the eastern side of the town. But Stevens Knoll is named today after my favorite name of an artilleryman here at Gettysburg, Greenleaf T. Stevens. He's in charge of Battery E, 5th Main Light Artillery, and that's their monument right there. Uh, this is a veteran uh, unit of the Union 1st Army Corps. At the Battle of Chancellorsville, they're going to be ravaged by losses uh, and have to be saved by some Pennsylvanians from the 140th Pennsylvania, as well as the Irish Brigade. And they come here to Gettysburg, and they're going to fight on the first day's battle and down here on the second and third day's battle as well. Now, uh, one of their gunners who will be down here, or one of their artillerymen, is a man by the name of John Chase. Uh, Chase is uh, going to be here at, he's going to be at Chancellorsville, and he's going to be here at Gettysburg. And he's here at Gettysburg. Uh, Chase, is, there are two different stories. He's either going to be uh, hit by an exploding shell, a Confederate shell that comes in and ignites another shell, uh, or his gun becomes so hot at the barrel when he goes to put the round down into the gun, Chase's, uh, the, the round itself will explode in Chase's face, and this is what he's going to look like later. Chase is actually going to be wounded 48 times. He's taken off of this battlefield in a cart, thought to be dead. He's going to awaken, uh, according to one story, two days later, and basically kind of startle the guy who's carrying the carrying his body in the wagon and say, did we win the battle? Uh, but uh, Chase is going to be knocked out of action, knocked out of the war, but for his actions at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, uh, John Chase is going to be the recipient of a Medal of Honor. Uh, Chase's Medal of Honor actually is housed today in the Chancellorsville uh, collection at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. Cool, thanks Chris, and it's so good to see so many hundreds of you watching already, and some of our good friends, Jim Voss, good to see you, we were just out here together, wish you were back. Our good friend Eric Mink from what we call Fred Spot, good to see you out here. And man, not only we have Chris White behind the camera, but we have Jeremy Martin who works with us at the Trust, he's a student at VCU, a history student no less, two ancestors in the battle, happy to have him here. And let me bring on, if I may, and by the way, hello to everybody, I already see uh, Virginia, lots of Virginians on this time, which is just great. We got North Carolina, we've got uh, Minnesota, and uh, earlier we had people from the UK and whatnot. So great to have you all here. Let me bring on our good friend Wayne Mott's National Civil War Museum. What about this attack on July 2nd, 1863? Thanks, Gary. You got everybody wishing they could be with us on this great sunny day here at Gettysburg. So we're gonna talk about July 2nd, 1863. We are standing on Stevens Knoll. As Chris just pointed out, take a look up off in the distance there you'll see the brick gatehouse of the Evergreen Cemetery. So the Evergreen Cemetery founded in 1854, the gatehouse built in 1855, 
and that is the target for the attack on July 2nd for two brigades of the Confederate Army that are going to be right over here, as Chris pointed in, we're looking right down the end of that particular line. And these two brigades in Jubal Early's division are going to be Harry T. Hayes' Louisianans and Isaac Avery's North Carolinians. The North Carolinians will be the brigade closest to us. And a little further on where you see the trees, guess what? Preserved American Battlefield Trust land in the distance. That will be the area of attack for Harry T. Hayes' brigade of Louisianans. They come right out of the town. This is going to be about sunset on July 2nd, 1863. They're going to rush up against Union troops on top of Cemetery Hill. Who are they? They're going to be mostly the troops that were out at Barlow's Knoll for the video that you all did up at Barlow's Knoll for the trust. And the Confederates will attack into that line at darkness. They'll get up on the top of uh, Cemetery Hill. They'll be hand-to-hand -hand fighting. One of the artillery batteries actually fires artillery rounds out of the barrel of the cannon without putting a fuse inside the explosive shell, which means the moment the explosive shell gets the end of the barrel, it blows up. How dangerous is that? Not only for the own gun crew, but now they're going to put it right up against the Confederate line. Colonel Isaac Avery, very famous story here at Gettysburg, a North Carolina commander on the left end of this attack here. He will actually get shot into the throat and fall down, and he writes a handwritten letter, Major Tate. Tell my father I died with my face to the enemy. He dies attacking Cemetery Hill here on July 2nd, 1863. And that note is still in business, or still exists, I should say, uh, in North Carolina. This Confederate attack, the difference between Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill is the Confederates actually stand on top of Cemetery Hill. They just can't hold it because elements of the 2nd Union Army Corps under Hancock's command come in and shove those men of Early's Division right off top of the hill. They get it. They just can't hold it. And over here at Culp's Hill, the Confederates get all the lower parts of that hill. They're in the trench works and brass works of Culp's Hill, but they don't get the crest. Cemetery Hill, Confederate soldiers take the crest. They just can't hold it, Gary. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. And I mean, you brought up so many good things. And that's the story of Gettysburg, isn't it? Where did the Confederates have success that they were able to actually hold on to that success? Hardly ever. Wherever they had some success, including at our one of our next stops at Pickett's Charge, um, you know, the Yankees show up with seemingly endless reinforcements from their interior lines in their fish hook position. And one more thing, you know, is, is how what Wayne said about Isaac Avery really can resonate to us. You know, can anybody, you know, you know, Imagine, you know, laying, dying on a slope, and wouldn't it be your family you're thinking of first? But the difference in the Civil War compared to today, I like to think people of the Civil War are very much like us. When I read their words, they're like we are, right? But Isaac Avery's first concern was to not only talk to his father, relate to his father, but that he died with his face to the enemy. That speaks to that hard to relate concept of 19th century honor. So uh, thanks so much for watching with us today. Uh, we're gonna bring you as much live and static as we can throughout the day to bring you the July 3rd uh, events that occurred 157 years ago. Please share this with your friends so as many people can you know, be sort of touched by American history as possible. This is your civic duty, so we appreciate you doing it. And we're so glad to have so many of you watching, especially putting up with the fact that we couldn't really go live yet yesterday, you try to go live on the south end of the Gettysburg battlefield and see how that goes as well. We now have Montana, we've got New Jersey, um, we've got uh, Maryland, I see Sykesville, Maryland, you know, and then it's probably going to be someone from Eldersburg now arguing about what's a better town there. Um, we got somebody loving the National Civil War Museum um, and all sorts of other people talking about how we can't let our history die and whatnot. Yes, okay, and if you're, if you're not involved with the battlefield, trust you, go to battlefields.org, just sign up for our emails, okay? We'll send you some information. We'll send you opportunities to help us preserve land, but mostly we'll send you educational assets that you can use and share with your friends. So I think we're going to go back to Chris White at this point, who's going to talk about a melange. That's right, a melange of various Stevens, Knoll, and Environs things. Yes, this is what you call useless knowledge. Uh, but the uh, area that we're standing on top of is actually right beside Upper Culp's Hill. And we're actually going to cross the street here, uh, take a little walk real fast. Uh, just to give you an idea of the number of units that will be up here. So we have the Union First Army Corps. Where do they come from? From the west side of the town. They come back to Cemetery Hill. They'll also come here to Culp's Hill. So these would have been some of the troops of James Wadsworth's division. If you know Wadsworth, he is going to have the famed Iron Brigade in his... Ooh, there's Gary. Yes, because we have none other than our award-winning teacher, Dave Weggy watching. So I wanted you to know when you talked about oh, the Iron Dave Brigade. Oh, Dave Hey, Dave. Do we still like him? We do. Okay, good. Go I ahead. I think he then. owes you another case of beer. Anyways, 
uh, we, we have an Iron Brigade marker over here uh, on Stevens Knoll, the little saddle between Stevens Knoll uh, heading over to Culp's Hill. We also have some entrenchments that will go over to this area. The 6th Wisconsin will be engaged here on July 1st and July 2nd, moving down towards Culp's Hill. So keep in mind, these troops that fought on the first day's battlefield will fight on the second and sometimes the third day as well. Uh, as we look out in the distance, we're looking at those rolling hills that would lead Hoke's uh, brigade as well as Hayes' brigade out here. If you're here on July uh, 1st and 2nd, late on the 1st and throughout the day on the 2nd, you would be subjected on the other side of those trees to sharpshooting fire coming from the town. And Greenleaf T. Stevens, whose battery is over here, Stevens is actually going to be wounded uh, from the town by a sharpshooter, uh, wounded in the leg and knocked out of action. Uh, the sharpshooter fire is going to be very intense on both sides, uh, so much so that o Oliver Otis Howard, the 11th Corps commander, is going to order a battery to start firing on the German Reformed Church, which we can't see today because he thought that there might be some sharpshooters there. Unfortunately, there are some Union uh, prisoners of war in a hospital there, and they're going to talk about their experience as well. Other sharpshooter fire will, will fire down into this valley that you're looking towards. If you're looking towards Weinbrenner's Run as well as towards the, Col the Henry Culp Farm, for which uh, Culp Hill is named after. There will be a lot of sharpshooter fire, so much so that Hayes' brigade is going to be uh, stuck out in those fields, hanging to a lip of Weinbrenner's Run, and it's really going to upset the Confederate Second Corps commander, Richard Yule. Uh, he wanted to pull his men back into town, but he couldn't do so. Uh, they're going to be exposed to fire throughout the day out there, and those Louisianans can lose as many as 67 men to sharpshooter fire. Uh, some of the 11th Corps guys who are out here will be hiding in an orchard that would have been on the other side of Cemetery Hill, and they talk about hiding behind a tree and the bark being stripped away as these sharpshooters pick away at them, trying to hit them. So this will be a very dangerous place to be. It's a very open and exposed area. Now on the morning of July 3rd, or I'm sorry, the afternoon of July 3rd, out towards that tower you might see out there, a, a radio tower, out in that vicinity uh, will ride Richard Yule, the 2nd Corps commander. He is going to ride into that area with one of his staff officers, a man named Henry Richardson, and as he's out there, uh, he is told by some of the Louisianans to get down if there is sharpshooter fire. He said, no, no, they're 1,500 yards away. They can't hit me. And moments later, Richardson is hit in the back and wounded severely, and Yule, too, is going to be wounded as well. Yes, there's a Confederate Corps commander wounded here at Gettysburg, but luckily for him, he is wounded in his wooden leg that he had lost in the prelude to 2nd Manassas. He swaps out his prosthesis, and Richard Yule is ready to go again, uh, probably feeling a little bit sheepish for being out there. There's a lot of action out in these areas, and the last thing I'll close on is Henry Slocum himself. This monument was placed to the 34-year-old here. Um, War Henry Warner Slocum is a brilliant guy. He doesn't shine the brightest here in the Gettysburg campaign, but whenever this, this monument was dedicated, I believe in 1902, Oliver Otis Howard is here. He comes here to um, help with the dedication and eventually will go down into town, climb atop the Fauna Stock building where he'll have a picture taken with Daniel Skelly, who was here with him in 1863. Skelly was 18 years old. He'll tell him about an observation tower uh, or an observation point on the Fauna Stock building. Howard goes there, watches the first day's field fighting there, and he goes up there in 1902 to take a picture with Skelly, and it's a great photograph of the one-armed general with the once young man. Uh, very cool, Chris. Thanks so much. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. We are live on Stevens Knoll. Wayne's got a couple more things. I've got a couple more things, so let's keep hitting it here. Make sure you share this with your friends. Come on over here, uh, Chris, if you will. I'll say that some of these woods that you see in the distance are still privately owned, and many of them are screening the Gettysburg School Complex, okay? There's a middle school there. The high school happily has moved. There's an elementary school back there as well. But if you, as you start to go up the hill, you, the members of the American Battlefield Trust, actually helped us preserve all those woods to the right of the large, uh, of course, uh, uh, water tower. Uh, I would love it if that water tower wasn't there, but considering it's there, it's something great to point to so that we can see, you know, uh, exactly where East Cemetery Hill is. That you also helped us preserve a property on the other side of those woods right near the tower as well, along 
along the lines of the Ohio soldiers that Wayne was talking about, so weakened from their first day's fight that they, and many of them are six feet apart. They were social dis distancing during the Battle of Gettysburg, and that is how the Louisianians just rolled over them. They were fought out, and they were too thin to stop the rolling wave of those soldiers who came in there. So there's so much to see from here. Like Chris was saying, you just look around and see everything. I want to add one thing on to, two things on to what Chris said. One is preservation related. You know, when Ewell was actually coming here, supposedly he stopped at the Josiah Benner farm, which you also helped us, helped us to preserve at, uh, um, the, along the old Harrisburg Road just north of Barlow's Knoll and along with that house we preserved a spring house and supposedly I don't know if it's true for sure but there is an account that suggested that he bathed his stump in the spring house and then how many other people drank that spring water separate story um, and the other thing I was going to say is I'm not sure I can't remember if Chris mentioned when he talked about these Iron Brigade trenches they do indeed go all the way up the hill but they also show um, there's a path that goes all the way up along the trenches and there are several monuments to the Wisconsin uh, units that are in the Iron Brigade, and lucky for them, they were not attacked on the north side of Culp's Hill. Wayne, do you still have something to add? I do. He's coming around this way. I'm going to turn you back around. I'm sorry. When you look up off in the distance where Chris was just pointing, you'll see just the base of the equestrian statue that belonged to General Oliver Otis Howard. You know, one of the great things I like about tour guiding and all the years that we've done it, preserving the land and preserving the artifacts, is telling the stories. One of the reasons why we're able to get people interested is we tell stories about the American Civil War. General Oliver Otis Howard was born in 1830. And General Howard is just 32 years old here in the Battle of Gettysburg. And he's got a very interesting history. He's a graduate of West Point in the regular army, a very pious man. But one of the things that Howard is known for, and I think very few people know, is he is the namesake of, or Howard University is a namesake of General Oliver Otis Howard. He also at one time was the head of the Freeman's Bureau. This is a bureau set up by Congress to help African Americans after, uh, or actually during the Civil War and then after the Civil War, uh, transition from their lives in, from enslaved to free. And Howard was at one time in charge of that. So he's got a very, very interesting career. He doesn't die until 1909, and he's buried up in Burlington, Vermont. So th these are the interesting stories, I think, Gary, for you know, for the Civil War. That's so cool. Yeah. And you know, and we'll encourage you all. We're seeing some questions. Somebody asked about are there any witness trees up here, and I'll answer that in a second. But note that you know, even though that we have probably spent a total, you know, of I don't know, a full 20 to 30 days just shooting live videos here over the years at Gettysburg 150. 156, 157, and in between, Remembrance Day, now and other times. Um, there's a huge body of these on our Facebook page and to a lesser extent on our YouTube channel. So go check those out. You can search and find out the things, you know, find the types of uh, videos that might interest you. For the witness trees, uh, as we covered yesterday, there's a witness tree at uh, the Trosso Farm. Uh, as you'll see in the next video we post, there is a remnant of a witness tree. You'll see what I mean about that later. Uh, we might post this actually a little bit later. Um, uh, on Culp's Hill, uh, the veteran of 1863 it's called there's one in the National Cemetery there's one near the field of Pickett's Charge and there are several along the Confederate line but I'm not aware of any here on Stevens Knoll I also see some other people asking some questions and see our good friend Uli Bauman coming up here so it's a free-for-all now we've hit our 15 minute mark we can keep going a little longer if anybody has anything extra Chris uh, the only thing I'll add is uh, you know this is tour stop 14 so you can actually come out here and stop uh, once you've gone up Culp's Hill, and I encourage you, uh, you know, to go to the whole battlefield, but there are so many places to go, and if you want to learn more about the wounding of Richard Yule, or if you want to go uh, to the Josiah Benner Farm, I'll give a plug to Chris Mikowski and Emerging Civil War. There are a bunch of uh, posts up there uh, written by somebody who might be holding the camera right now to teach you a little bit more about those actions. <laughs> uh, good, good. Uh, let's see. Uh, God, I was, I was reading things, so if you just queued me up, I missed it, Chris. I did not. Okay, good, good. So I see a, a bunch of other people watching, and I'll, I'll mention my favorite hashtag so far, hashtag social distancing 1863. Uh, so way to go, Charlie, on that. I think we're going to wrap this one up. We have a lot more to cover, and of course we have what some people call the climax of the Battle of Gettysburg, what others call the climax of the high watermark of the Civil War. We're going to talk about that. We may have some special artifacts with us um, as we go and look for other videos throughout the day, today, tomorrow, and the next day, and probably even a day after. That's how much we have shot, and of course, look 
look at our videos from the last two days. We appreciate you watching. It's not too late at this point to share this with your friends because I'll tell you what, if we get uh, you know two or 3,000 views in the first hour, we usually get about seven times that much in the next couple of days. So most people are watching later. That's good. A lot of you should be working anyway if you're not observing Independence Day today. So thank you for watching. Thanks to Chris for the extra interpretation behind the camera. Jeremy for giving us support and Wayne Motts from the National Civil War Museum. Thank you all for supporting Battlefield Preservation and helping to spread our education mission.